Hello everyone who's here and hello everyone who's not here, uh, who's at home watching. Um, so welcome to live at Timucua. This is our hybrid version of our events. Uh, Mid-November uh, mid 2020 is still in the weird because you know people are going to be able to see that um, video for years to come. And uh, so this is in the midst of the craziness still, but we do allow 12 people, people at this point to come in the house. house. Uh, and it feels so pretty, pretty safe, safe for, uh, as you can see, we're all masked, and uh, we, we are, are trying to say, you are in, in for a treat, because this is going to be a fabulous one, but, but I will not tell, tell you about it, except I will tell you something, if you're watching live, tomorrow at 1 p.m., there is another concert online, that was recorded last week by Hannah Song, and it's really, really nice, one of our own pieces, it's beautiful, very, very good, so you will want to watch that, so... Thank, Thank you so much for watching, watching and uh, I, I will, will pass the baton to Charlie Griffin. Thank, Thank you, Charlie. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm Charlie Griffin, Griffin and uh, 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 I'm really looking forward to tonight. This is the first event, event that, that the Central Florida Composers Forum, Forum is undertaking since. since COVID started, and uh, this, is, this is like an oasis in the desert, desert for us, it really, really is, the rehearsals have been very moving. moving. And uh, I want to thank uh, Ariel, Ariel Francisco, who is our poet, poet tonight, tonight, and um, mm -hmm. uh, we're really looking, looking forward to working with him. So he has this fantastic book of poetry that I can't recommend enough, it's called The Sinking Ship, it's still a ship, and then it was published by Borough Press this past year, actually they can't, can they see it now? Yeah, yeah. On, on the live I don't know. Um, but, but anyway, I can, I can see, see him. Uh, um, so, so this, this is, is our second collaboration between Central Florida Coastal Coast Coast Forum and Borough Press. Press. And, and when, when Ryan, Ryan brought out Ariel's book, I knew that, that it was a thing, thing that, that we wanted to work with. with. Uh, it's, it's so musical and so uh, rich in its imagery. And uh, well, you'll hear from him and you'll hear yourselves uh, just how spectacular it is. Um, so, so I won't, I won't talk for, for very long here, I'll, I'll, I'll let us get started, but I, I do want to thank, again, um, Ryan Reeves from Borough Press and Ariel for being here and being able to speak for yourself in a minute, and then Benoit, uh, Tintigua, and, uh, Chris Belt, and then of course our performers and composers, so, um, without further ado, I'll, I'll just, um, I'll pass the floor over to, uh, Ariel to introduce himself, he's going to read the first, uh, what we're going to do, let me actually, I'm not going to do it just yet, sorry. Um, so, so what we're going to do is, uh, Ariel will read uh, uh, four of his poems for, to begin with, and then we will hear Bob Walker's setting for music of those four poems, and then we'll go back and forth between the poetry and the songs that set those poems. And if you don't mind, 
Um, we're going to have a, a Q&A at the end, and go ahead and if questions strike you along the way, go ahead and chat, chat oh, sorry, type them into the chat box on the live stream. stream. And, and then, then we, we will answer, answer your questions, questions in the order, order that they were received, I guess. Then we'll do that for us. But, but so, so yeah, yeah, go ahead and type, type your questions, questions in as, as they occur. occur to you. All right, so now, thank you very much. All right. Can, uh, can you guys hear me? Am I, am I loud and clear and, and visual? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I can't hear anyone's reactions. I'm going to take that as a yes. Yeah, thumbs up. Is that a, okay? Cool. Um, yeah, thanks so much to, to everyone um, for being here in person and virtually. Thanks so much to Charles and Eric uh, and, and everyone involved. This is uh, one of the coolest things I think I will ever do. This is not a thing that, uh, that I know of that exists. So when somebody brought it up, I was like, yeah, this sounds awesome. Uh, I'll definitely do it. Um, and I got a lot of love for, for Orlando. I have my Orlando Magic jacket on right now just for the reading. Um, hopefully I'll be able to be down there sometime soon. Uh, if anything returns to any kind of normal. So thank you so much to everyone involved and, and everyone for being here. Um, I'll read four poems to start. Uh, the first one is called An Insomnia Poem. Night nails stars into the darkening sky like a father fixing a roof post-storm as his son watches with tiny curiosity. I can almost hear the hammering ear against pillow. Uh, and the second one is called, Ha, this one's about insomnia too. My bed is a godless church, yet I still pray there every night. Am I a fool? I can almost hear other worshipers in their far off corners, the small breath of their hands unclasping. Uh, and then these two are our haiku, which are always kind of fun to write. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear. Uh, how these sound musically. Uh, this is called Pessimistic Haiku. A homeless man with a sign that reads, the end is upon us, I wish. And the last of these first four, haiku written at a gas station. Palm trees are waving hello or goodbye to you. Don't be rude, wave back. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Walker Jr. And uh, uh, I sent these uh, uh, four poems to me, so that you're not to hear. Um, I took the challenge of, of you know, going, going through the, reading the whole book. It was um, great to read the, the poetry um, itself and trying to find a piece to do. And so I decided to take the challenge of, of doing the four shorter pieces. Um, I, as a songwriter, you kind of write in that small aspect anyhow, and that's where my, my forte is. So I wanted to translate that into these settings. And I said, well, how can I take a haiku and put it into music and, and have it go. So I hope I, I did the uh, poems justice for you. Um, so enjoy uh, the music settings to the four poems that we just heard.
Uh, that was amazing. That was, wow. I can't even, uh, Jesus, this is great. <laughs> um, wow. So, uh, two more poems now for me, right? Um, the first one on seeing a photo of an octopus in a parking garage. Again, they blame the super moon, the king tide marching out to war with land but this is new. The first floor of this parking garage turned into an atoll overnight and floating in the strange water is an octopus, gray as death. Its eight arms spread straight out like the points of a compass, reaching equally in every direction for a way back home. And the second one is called Still Water, Still Water. I've outlasted more gray skies in this life than I care to count, and I will survive many more. This I know. It's the blue that kills me, that emptiness left behind after such rain, enough to float on and float on until the drops desist, that familiar blankness returning above, that familiar stillness surrounds me and tells me it's over. Thank you. Hello, I'm Eric Branch, and I'm here to introduce my piece, The King Tide Marching Out to War with Land. Thank you. Which is a, two poems of Ariel Francisco, the two poems that Ariel just read. Uh, when I set the first one on seeing a photo of an octopus, I did not know that this was based on a real anecdote, a real story, and I interpreted it almost as a nightmare, which makes sense because it is a nightmare come to life. The uh, Miami being inundated and its future of inundation. And the second one, uh, still water, still water, I felt that I felt this uh, atmosphere of, of sort of listlessness and melancholy and a blurry, hazy quality. And of course, this was the song I was finishing up just as we went into the pandemic. So the last line, and tells me it's over, really had a big impact on me. Anyway, I would, I'd love to thank uh, Anna and Christine for performing my music, and Ariel for writing the music and being kind enough to let me uh, set it. It's a pleasure to get to collaborate with you. And now, the king tide marching out to war with land. Thank you.
Wow. Uh, Christ, that was amazing. Um, Jeez. <laughs> I don't know how I'm supposed to follow up <laughs> the music with my own poems. This is, uh, this is really, really incredible. My God. Um, so next, uh, just the one poem, um, and this is written for uh, Paul Ceylon was a, a Jewish German language poet who lived uh, in the 20th century. Um, so this is called Paul Ceylon floated in the scene for 11 days before he was found. Sometimes spring brings no change. Sometimes the air's heaviness seeps into this life little by little until even the genius mechanism of our hearts goes tired and torrid and dark, slowing like footsteps approaching shore and staring into the water. All thought drowns eventually, whether in mind or in the shallows, the strange patience of our bodies bitter under the sun's constant passage, a deep well with his splintered bucket of dried hope laying at its depth, his last empty draw. Does this explain your heart? Thank you. So I am not now, nor have I ever been Rebecca Todia. <laughs> But Rebecca uh, could not be with us tonight. She, she is uh, at home watching on the live stream. So Rebecca, uh, we love you and sorry that you couldn't be here. Um, Rebecca is a, uh, from, she's from Miami. So these poems uh, resonated with her uh, tremendously. And uh, one of the things that, that she loves to do as a composer when she's setting text, she's all about uh, what we call word painting trying to create in the music things that, that represent the feelings and images um, from the, the poetry. And so she asks that you listen for those things in the music. And she's given you a little bit of a roadmap that she sent to me in a text message. So I will provide that to you. Uh, she talks about, um, uh, there's, there's, it's, pretty, it's a little composerly, some of the things she wrote. She said, uh, there's a borrowed chord in the second measure, which basically means it's a chord that doesn't, um, that, that it's going to sound a little uh, unfamiliar in a way. Uh, but so uh, that represents change. And then she has uh, arpeggios representing water. And in the final section, uh, she has this feeling of constantly pulling back uh, to convey the feeling of an undercurrent uh, pulling away from the shore. Um, and then she also adds that uh, the, the line, the strange patience of our bodies, bitter under the sun's constant passage. It, for that stanza, she added a repetitive, uh, what's it called, an augmented chord, uh, to represent the sun beaming down relentlessly as we wait patiently for it to resolve. So um, uh, here's Rebecca Todia's setting of Ariel Francisco. Thank you. 
wow again jesus christ um that <laughs> i don't even have words this is all just very uh incredible and amazing to me uh and i feel very fortunate um this next one uh just one poem again um this one funny enough this is an orlando poem actually this is something that happened to my dad on a I think it was on hoffner if you guys know where that is um Driving to work, I stopped suddenly to let an alligator cross the road. As if it needed anyone's permission to clog up tra traffic with its presence. Laws don't apply to something so ancient. Jaywalking with the slow grace of changeless millenniums. Its heavy body dense with survival. Scales the color of concrete after rain. No one honks. No one dares disturb its silent commute. A crossing guard uses her giant stop sign to corral the school children on the corner, but even they are shocked into quiet curiosity until the gator enters the underbrush, leaving our world as it came, mystified into that green. Thank you. Uh, I'm Keith Lay, and uh, uh, thank you, Ariel, for this poem, and thank you. Uh, it's so great to be a part of this community. So thank you, Charlie, for keeping this going. Uh, so I want you to listen for four things. The poem, and a low, always climbing bass note that takes its time crossing the road. That's the alligator. It's all the way through. And then there's number three, the human music, which is kind of carefree and in its thoughts. And it's, I call, think of it as the fast music is us. And then the intersection of these is the fourth thing. And that is the mystery of of meeting, interfacing with the wider world of the alligator of nature. Thank you.
Wow, that's it's incredible, man. I, I don't even have uh, this has happened every time, but uh, Jesus, um, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, again, thank you to to everyone involved and everyone here in person, virtually. Um, this is all incredible and kind of stupefying to me. I, I can't believe this is happening. Um, so I think these are uh, the last two poems. Um, this first one, uh, the the title of the poem is a haiku uh, by the, the famous haiku master Basho. And each last line of each uh, last word of each line and this poem spells out um, the title. So it's called Harvest Moon, the tide rises almost to my door. And if you read the last word of each line, it would read that out, right? Harvest Moon, the tide rises almost to my door. When the ocean comes to harvest our cities under golden moonlight, how long will it take for the morning to come? What will tide you over the water that rises and rises with a perpetuating lie? Almost will soon become now. So where to go from here? When waves reach my home, I'll make a raft of the door. And the last one um, is kind of like an ode or maybe more like a eulogy to the city of Miami. Uh, so this is called Sinking City. Beyond rescue, Miami is a cruise ship lost at sea with no lifeboats, throwing it an all-night an all dance party, music and stamping feet drowning out the sound of taking on water. But no, not lost. The sea knows exactly where it is. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ariel. So yeah, so uh, now I am Charlie Griffin, and I, <laughs> not Rebecca Todia still. And I, um, so I set those two wonderful poems to music. They're so powerful. Ugh. <laughs> right? I can't take it how good those poems are. <laughs> but um, OK, anyway, so uh, yeah, uh, so the, the, as a composer, I guess you know, I just kind of felt that my job was to just try to feel those poems in music, basically. And that's what I hope I did. Um, the first one certainly seems to be uh, about the anger of, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna put some words in Ariel's mouth here, but you know, like the, you know, as we watch our politicians do nothing, that it gets just increasingly serious. And um, that's really infuriating. And then, um, and the other thing is basically about accepting our impermanence, isn't it, I think? And so uh, those are two really contrasting uh, moods. And I think the, hopefully the music conveys those two very different moods um, in their own way. All right, so thank you.
So I think now also actually comes a time where we have to confess that we did not figure out exactly how we were going to handle the question and answer portion. <laughs> you know, with the social distancing piece. How, how are we handling this, Benoit? Yeah, uh, we're not going to use that mic, so I'm going to like boost these instead so that we can hear everybody's question. And also the answer from him. Okay. The only issue is like we're going to have to be careful about you and me saying anything. So if you want to go on stage, it'll just be easier for, I think the composer should be on stage. And maybe the, the, the performers, uh, if there's questions, they can uh, ask me that they can answer. And you will be there, you will. I, if, if I get any, I have not seen any yet, but if I get any from the uh, from the screen, I will okay. definitely relay those. <laughs> the other boys are going. <laughs> I can get you started if you want, because I have a question to the composers, is how do you actually get started? Like that's where I struggle the most as an amateur composer is the first idea, how, how to get it. After that, it's a lot easier. <laughs> Eric breathed in first. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, I'm, I'm always trying to find a I guess you'd say a 
kernel or musical idea that sort of uh, encapsulates the whole idea of something. For instance, with um, Octopus, I was thinking, as I said, I thought of it almost as a nightmare. This is something that actually happened. It, uh, it did flood in Miami and uh, an octopus actually landed in a parking garage. <laughs> so I thought, I almost thought of this, but I didn't know that when I started setting the poem. So I thought of this as almost a, a nightmare. And I, I immediately thought of, well, I saw Anna play Anne Boleyn in a six of eight. This is a show that was done at the Fringe Festival. It's based on Libby Larson's uh, Try Me Good King. And she was Anne Boleyn going to the scaffold. And I kept thinking of that. And I think a lot of the, the angular intervals and things, the very nervous color square, that came from that. On the other hand, still water. I mean, it's in the title that it suggests that it's smooth and tranquil, not really. I, you know, I saw color words in it like blue. So, I mean, I, I, my idea was it's this blurry, hazy atmosphere and the singer is sort of, the singer's line is sort of like a thread pulling through it. I, I, I would add, I mean, it's, it's not an exact, answer to Benoit's question because it's in this case it was so specific but I think that there's something so primal about water mm -hmm. for all of us mm -hmm. and that it, it ran as this thread throughout the, the poems and so it was really something easy to latch onto as something that would be uh, moving to me personally and, and uh, so I think you know, between the water and the gators and the octopus, like there's so much <laughs> of the natural world for us to um, ponder and to, to try to uh, kind of use that as, to me, that, that it was the, as the text that was the, the kind of ignition for, for the music. Agreed. And there was a, I thought there was a sort of commonality of tone that still allowed for contrast. Mm -hmm. For instance, I originally was going to do three poems and the one that was going to be in the middle was the one that Charlie said, but you know, there's only so much time. But they all, it's still, even with that middle poem missing, it's, there was still an obvious connection between the two, I said. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of everyone's really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with this, the start is, you know, the, the start's really the text. So, you know, we have to thank Ariel for uh, writing great text to, <laughs> for us to go through. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I remember, uh, you know, getting the, seeing the call to do this and reading through the poems and there were many of them that I would read and, and kind of hear ideas for to get started, uh, I think was where it was. So I think I had, um, I had quite a few of them, I think I had like seven or eight of them where I started ideas down going, well, which one do I do? And then mm -hmm. as the deadline comes in, of, you know, pick the ones that you need to do <laughs> and the time limits, you kind of work under that constraint a little bit um, to get the creativity to go through that. Um, so really the start was really the text, you know, kind of drove the ideas and, and how do you, you know, as Charlie said earlier in the introduction of his, how do we get the music to sound like what the idea of the text is, or at least our interpretation of that. Uh, I have do you guys have, do you guys have questions for Ariel? Oh. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, actually too. I do. <laughs> Ariel, um, the, fir the uh, first poem that I said, um, seeing a photo of an octopus, I said, I said to Anna when I was describing the song to her that I interpreted it almost as a nightmare, but I didn't know whether you did. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, it, it is. It's funny that you say that because what you described is exactly it's a it's a living nightmare, you know, as a metaphor for kind of what's happening. Because uh, I remember seeing that photo and like, oh wow, this is a really bad joke and a bad Photoshop. And then I was like, oh wait, no, this isn't a real newspaper and this is actually happening. Uh, and it was just, yeah, it's, it's a nightmare. It's, it's a kind of um, 
but the kind of distance to it, right? It's not just like a nightmare for me, but this is like a nightmare world that we live in where something like that happens and then it's in the newspaper and then people forget about it the next day because there's another terrible thing that's happening. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, yeah, I think you absolutely nailed it, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I want to throw that, you know, because um, my, my family, we watched uh, the Netflix show, My Octopus Teacher. Yes. And, and actually, it just makes me wonder now, uh, imagine this from the octopus's perspective, <laughs> right? That, that, you know, to s suddenly show up, like you're, in, you're swimming in your home and all of a sudden you're at a parking lot. It's just as bad for them <laughs> as it is for us. <laughs> anyway, Keith, you had something you wanted to ask? Yeah, anyway, I'm curious on how, uh, how we, what, uh, what's your creation? Uh, is it ritual? Is it something you do every day? Is it something you wait for inspiration? Is it something that you give yourself deadlines? How do you like to work? Um, yeah, I think I just, I, I try to, um, to engage with it constantly. I think one of the upsides of, of being a writer is working with language, right? So something I, I always tell even my students, if you're paying even a little bit of attention, you could just be watching TV, you could be watching Netflix, but if you're paying attention to the language, I think that counts as, as part of the creative process. Um, Cause then things stand out to you, right? It could just be a single word, uh, whatever it is. So I'm always reading, um, but I, I teach a lot too, and, I, and I'm still in school, I'm getting a second master's now. Um, but, and, and one thing I'm missing with uh, being locked down uh, in quarantine, especially up here in New York now, is I miss uh, writing at coffee shops and at bars, which I know is kind of cliche, but it's, it's fun to have that ambiance and to have this kind of random bits of language. You hear people talking, you kind of eavesdrop on conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, my creative process has been sort of really embedded into my everyday life where I'm just like always listening, um, even passively now. And then I try to make time I keep notebooks. Um, I try to write something every day, even if it's just like a little note, a word that I heard that might be interesting to use. Uh, and then when I can kind of cobble together some free time, I have a lot to work with it uh, by going back to those notes and looking at my notebooks, etc. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. It's kind of, I have, uh, it's, 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 it's like a sloppy discipline. You know, I don't sit down <laughs> at an hour every day to do it. I do it all the time, but it's just kind of all over the place. But I do do it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually have a, I have a question for Ariel as well. I, I'm I'm curious how uh, how how you you think your writing may or may not be changing now that you're in New York as opposed to having lived in Florida. What's it, what's it? How's it changing your 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 stuff? Uh yeah, that's a good question. Um the the big thing with writing about Florida is that. Um, I wanted to leave it very badly. I think that's another thing that comes through in the book. Um, there's definitely a lot of bitterness. There's a lot of love. It's kind of complicated, right? Um, but I, I kind of wrote my way out of there. So now, because um, I am always writing about my surroundings. So New York, the New York poems now are taking a little bit of a different shape. Um, but there's a lot of family history stuff too. So it's kind of a different direction also. Uh, all my immediate family now lives uh, in Florida. My brother and dad are in Orlando. Uh, my sister and my mom are down in Miami, uh, but I was born in New York in the Bronx and a lot of our family is still there. So it's kind of going back uh, to my own personal history, writing poems um, from anecdotes my dad has told me, uh, different things and, and piecing a different thing together. Um, but still very much the, the landscape and what's going on is, is still a big part of um, my, my poetry and what I'm writing now. But even more so, I've been uh, translating a lot also. So more than being in New York, I'm reading a lot <laughs> in Spanish now and, and then writing in English. So the whole kind of inspiration process has drastically changed too. Uh, you know, consuming something in one language and then producing it in another is, is, is a super interesting kind of thing that's happening to me right now also. I'm curious to see if Ariel has uh, questions for the performers. <laughs> or maybe the composers have questions for the performers.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be a, a pretty good uh, moment for us to appreciate their <laughs> their vital artistry. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> to the poetry mm -hmm. because I, was gonna, I mean we both know singers who you know sing beautiful Anna and I have sung together <laughs> several times and we know people who just their their attitude towards preparing a song is I learn the notes I do the IPA and <laughs> oh there's something interpretation wise and my coach told me that and that didn't happen here at all everything Anna did was from the ground up I mean, for instance, we talked after uh, after I heard her sing some things I thought of, but all of this really came from Anna and Christina, interpretation-wise. Mm -hmm. Cool project. <laughs> Thank you for being a part. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, <laughs> Thank you, Ariel, for, for, for everything. Yeah. Sorry you couldn't be here, that was the original plan, by the way, that was what was going to be, but thank you, so, F you, COVID. <laughs> cool. Yeah, all right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.